Peter Peter Peterson. Peterson. Oh my goodness. Okay. That it's really interesting too. Yeah. It really is. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. Jordan Peterson does have a um, <clears throat> sort of an unusual style at, at some point, but he, he seems to uh, rile up the people that he's having conversations with in so many ways. And uh, I just wonder how Zizak might respond to. Well, him it, it was. It's really. I thought it would not be a format that would serve Zizek well as because he's sort of like a moth. He doesn't really fly straight. His conversation never really goes from point A to B. Exactly. So, so uh, yeah. I figured it would be a bit of a train wreck, but it's interesting because uh, and you can see what you think when you... Okay, I'll, I'll definitely look I, at that. I think that, that sure. Peterson sort of entered this with the idea that Zizek might be a charlatan and that this would be, you know, that he would be... Uh, and, um, and even though... Peterson doesn't necessarily engage directly with Zizek's ideas. He sort of picks sort of a, almost a straw man Marx and sort of spends his time um, sort of attacking that. Right, um, right, right. And in a way, done that. I've seen that happen. Yeah, it's it's not, just, you know, and so uh, there's lots really of ways to be critical of Marx. You don't necessarily have to generate a straw man, but that, that seems to be. Uh, right. And um, uh, I get the sense that um, there was a moment in the, in the debate where the, he says, well, you know, I, I, when I found out Zizek's written 60 books, there's no way I could have read all that. Right. And I got at that moment, I think he was aware that, wait a minute, he was dealing with someone who, who, who even if he were completely wrong, couldn't be an idiot because he'd written 60 books. Right, right. <laughs> and and I, got, I think that's one of uh, Jordan Peterson's um, principles, too. What? But, uh, rules. I'm going to the 12 rules right now. Assume that, you're, assume that the person you are listening uh, to might know something you don't. Mm-hmm. I think that was the connection. Yeah, so yeah. sorry for all that, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So he was engaged with that conversation, and he had sixty books to read. He wasn't going to do that, but he gave him some credit. <laughs> by the well, way, I, so. I got the sense that that sort of you know the the tone sort of shifted a bit. And but you got to see this debate. You got to you got to see this. It's oh, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. It was it was a big deal, and I think um, I forget how much dough they each got, and I think it was like I may be wrong. But I thought it was like two hundred grand, something like that. Yeah, a lot of money. And again, this is also from what I understand, Zizek gave his away. Okay. So he did not. He did not. He <laughs> took the money and it was given. And he showed kind up. Of true to form on on some. Well, of he that. is a that's, Marxist. That's a hard to do. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. Got to you know, spread the <laughs> spread the uh, the wealth. Um, well, it's interesting too that these these are two big figures. They have mm-hmm. uh, followers and camps and that follow them. And so, the uh, part of part of the problem is for that person who's so engaged in their own work to step outside and really kind of follow someone else to a point mm-hmm. where it then leads to a great conversation where the people know each other fairly well and they can kind of converse in the issues, as opposed to coming up with the straw man argument. And that well, kind of thing, the so. point of the conference, sort of the overarching theme is, you know, at some point, Zizek's going to die. What happens to the, the legacy he's left? What happens? And so how do we think about that? And from a um, Lacanian perspective, uh, this is sort of lifted from Freud, but what happens in therapy is is that you, um, you come into session. In some ways, you begin to see the analyst or the therapist as the person who's supposed to know things, the subject's supposed right. to know. So, right. And you have this fantasy that there is someone out there uh, be it the president or whoever, who's got it all together, right. and they know, and so things are cool. Right. And as you traverse that fantasy, as you get to the other side of it, you begin to realize, wait a minute, nobody has a clue, <laughs> or we have clues. Unfortunately, but there we're is, finding that. you know, there is no subject supposed to know. I mean, I remember when I, you know, first started working at the at the university, and and oh, the president, well, the president of the university. But then you start hanging out with these folks, and you realize, wait a minute, I mean, they. Right. They may know some things, but yeah. nobody here is really right. Right, we're all doing the best we can. That's really There's a, a end. tendency to put people on these pedestals, right? We're I all, mean, that's how we uh, typically you know, do things. But yeah, meet them in their human life. They're the rest just, of you know, us. Right. Okay. And uh, um, so you move from that position, and once you get to that, you begin to accept that there is a basic lack. There's something missing in all of us that none of us have quote the answer, and there's no and. The fact that we don't have the answer is what causes everything to keep moving. That at the center of everything is is something missing that causes things to move. And so it is constitutive. It is, it is present in a way that's necessary. And the minute we're able to embrace that, 
that void, that absence at the center of things, that can we, we can move differently and that we are then maybe potentially liberated in, to move in a way that moves us closer to the things that we, may, we might want or makes us a little more comfortable with the things that we might want. Desire is a big part of this too. Right. But So you get from those two points. And so I haven't, I mean, I'm just writing up the proposal for the paper at the moment, but what if a post-Peterson or post-Gizak, these are supposed to happen. The title of my paper is, um, right. so far, is He is Riven. If you meet Zizek on the road, kill him. And All right, I like the title. <laughs> it's provocative. Um, but the idea behind that is... Get folks is, into your attendance. It'll be more than three people. Uh, well, there'll be one. three angry people. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there'll be a... a, a um, that's the Buddhist notion. There's even a book called If You Meet Buddha on the Road, right. Kill Him. And the idea behind that is is that... Um, to, to meet the Buddha would be to be trapped by the Buddha, and that it is the absence, it is the post-Buddha or the post-Zizek that's more important that the Zizek is here. Because how do we keep moving mm-hmm. in the way that only we can move if, we're, if we believe there is someone out there who knows and we are enthralled to them? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, there is a way in which, be it any public figure, Peterson or Zizek, could fill the role of subjects supposed to know in a way it doesn't necessarily move things forward or could be, um, uh, I mean, that's the essence of some form of fascism.